Hey everybody, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 122. Aaron, uh, it's a little strange not doing a live show with all the comments and the, the people in the show. What do you think? I think it's weird. It's, it's been a while and I, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to do with my hands. Yeah, we've done that joke before. I'm not going to run that one again. But, uh, you know, again, much like the uh, the shark season, uh, not having fans in the stands. It's, again, it's kind of weird not having the community interact with. It just kind of goes to show uh, how much fun those are for us and uh, how much we uh, miss and appreciate those. So uh, stay tuned for more information about when we'll be going live later on. But for this show, it is a recorded show, and uh, we are going to be talking about the shark season, uh, how it started, how it kind of uh, developed and maybe fell apart a little bit. And then we'll probably be touching on uh, what's kind of to come after that? So uh, the expansion draft and that what? Well, we'll talk a little bit about those things. But uh, Aaron, are you ready to start the show? I'm ready. Okay, then uh, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, take us away, Super Producer Jason. So to start the show off, we're going to talk a little bit about the training camp. And uh, the first thing I want to say here is uh, this is going to be a very uh, video clip and graphic heavy episode, probably one of the heavier <laughs> ones that we've done. Uh, so if you are listening on a podcast, it might be a good idea to flip over to YouTube also and uh, take a look at this stuff because we do have some things that are, require some visual aid. Uh, but if you're watching on, on YouTube, uh, you're going to be able to see all the graphics and everything else. So I think we're just going to go ahead and roll this, this clip here. But Aaron, did you want to set this up a little bit? Sure. Like just a refresher about how the season started um, or not even the season, but training camp, the Sharks in uh, Santa Clara County, when when the coronavirus was really hitting hard at the end of December, uh, they were not allowed to even practice in in San Jose anywhere in in, in the county. So uh, the Sharks made a deal with Arizona Coyotes to use their facilities in Arizona because Arizona at the time was, I think, fairly wide open, if not wide open. So they moved everything over there and the Sharks started off uh, away from home during training camp and uh, were, were playing in Arizona and had not, were not allowed to be in, even in San Jose, I think, till the end of January, or early February. I can't even remember. Uh, but yeah, let's roll this clip. This was uh, a question asked uh, what the biggest challenge for the coaches were with not having training camp in San Jose. Well, I think I, um, the biggest challenges for us is, is we feel that we, we, we're bringing some change, um, you know, to the way we play. Um, and that window of, of, you know, the opportunity of t- to try and get all those changes down and, and, and perfect them and make them become instinct in, in a matter of a couple of weeks. So that's really what our focus has been on the last uh, a couple of weeks is, is, you know, planning day to day training camp, what those practice plans are going to look like, um, you know, what, what we're going to show in video and, and how we're going to get through practice. Because the biggest thing is, is not only getting all this new information and, and trying to, uh, you know, perfect it is also making sure that practices are also up to speed and, and that we're, you know, uh, trying to be as game speed as possible. So, um, you know, there's no preseason games and, uh, you know, that's the tough part, I, I think, too, is, you know, you want to try and get your team ready. But, uh, um, you know, besides scrimmaging and practicing, there's not a lot of game tight situations. Yeah, that, that's really tough going into a training camp that there are no practice or no um, preseason games. So and and the Sharks had not played at that point, I think, 10 months since uh, their last game. So they had not played an opponent for 10 months. They didn't know where they could have stood for a lot of the prospects and other players that would be up and coming and possibly cracking the NHL lineup. And the only way they could really tell is by having scrimmages against themselves. So you're never going to replicate a game atmosphere in a scrimmage because uh, for one, you don't want to hurt your teammates. At least I don't think you'd want to right? Um, going hard against the boards or, or hitting. And there's definitely most likely not going to be any fighting. So it's a much different feel and a different game in that environment than it would be to get at least some scrimmage or uh, uh, preseason games in. So that was very difficult. Plus new systems being introduced. Um, I think it was a new power play, new defensive, like team defensive system. Everything was pretty much uh, changed around from from the season before. So there was a lot of things to work on and not a lot of time to do it. And they were staying in a hotel for a very long time. So um, it was a very difficult thing for the coaching staff to do. And they knew it going in. It wasn't like it, they, it was a surprise. But nonetheless, it was still a very difficult thing 
for them to overcome. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other part of this is that we've talked about this uh, on, on the show previously about how difficult it must have been to, you know, having the, the whole COVID thing going on. And all teams had to deal with that. But the Sharks in particular, again, like you said, playing out of Arizona to start the, the season off, not having the benefit of preseason. And even before all that started, not having the benefit of playing a little bit of hockey in terms of playoffs and whatnot. So this is a team that was outside the bubble and they couldn't get any games in. Uh, from when the season originally had ended, uh, you know, the other teams that had been able to play in the playoffs that made the playoffs at least got some games in before this new season started up. Sharks were not in that that grouping. So uh, this starts even well before this season's issues uh, with them not being able to get much playing time and, and work together. And like you said, uh, being not able to have a rookie camp, training camp, um, any of those things that would happen normally during the season, and then having to do that living out of a hotel away from your family and, and everything else, uh, it's, it's got to be really difficult. Now, again, it sounds like we're making excuses here, but uh, the reality of it is these guys are human beings. And I think as fans, if we could try to put ourselves in their shoes, you know, it's having to work your job from a hotel away from your family for months at a time when maybe you've not done your job for <laughs> the better part of almost a year, I think anybody would uh, would struggle coming back to it. So. Um, definitely feel for the guys um, and, you know, uh, hopefully looking forward to a better season in the season to come. But uh, we also have another clip here. I believe this is about uh, some of the young guys and the expectations. And again, this is Bob Bugner, as you could tell from the quality of the video clip, because they were just figuring out what they were going to be doing for their Zoom calls. Um, it, they, uh, <laughs> this is happening at the beginning of the season, not not near the end of the season. We'll get to some of the clips from the exit interviews and whatnot later on in the show. But uh, to start off here, this is just another one from the beginning of the season. Now, Aaron, did you want to set this one up as well? There was anything you wanted to say about this? Uh, just a great question of what the expectations were of some of the young players coming out of, I guess, from the season before and going into the season and what Bob Bugner was expecting to see from these guys. Yeah, well, I think the the guys that, you know, came in at, towards the end of the year, uh, I'm excited to see, um, you know, again, it's not like a typical year where you, you don't see these guys for three months. It's been, you know, nine months plus. And, uh, you know, what, what how their bodies have changed some of these young guys. And I know they've worked hard and put muscle on. So you want to see that. But, uh, you know, how the how the the layoff has affected some guys. And, and uh, you know, Noah Gregor is one. Uh, Dylan Gambrell. Um, you know, even Mario had a great year as a young guy coming back and, and see his progression. I think that, uh, you know, there's other guys that are going to get their shots, uh, Latunov and, and Alex True. And, and, and uh, I mean, I, there's a list of guys I want. I'm anxious to see how Merkley and, and Brinson Pasternak and guys like that coming in. Um, you know, my first impression of these guys, one, are they ready? Have they put the work in off the ice? Um, and are they ready mentally um, to get into camp and, and really dive in and um, you know, and, and try and, and, and try and really make our team. And I think it's important uh, that inner competition, some of these young guys, because there's definitely some opportunity. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, okay. this is why I wanted to go back and do this. Cause it's interesting to see how hopeful everyone was going into the season and what their expectations were, I guess, for some of these guys. Right. Okay, real quick, real quick. Let's just go over the names first, and then I'll let you kind of launch. Um, okay. He said True, Latunov. He said Merkley, Pashnuk. Pashnuk got a look. Uh, I mean, True got a look too, but um, and that was near the end. But they were kind of hoping that maybe these guys would kind of step in and uh, potentially take, you know, maybe a lesser role in the team, obviously, but maybe a role on the team. Uh, so go ahead, Aaron, take it away. Well, we at the if you look if you. Think about what he was saying. The end of last season, we saw a lot of Latunov and True making the lineup. So that doesn't surprise me that he was expecting them to probably do the same thing going into this season. Um, Merkley is interesting. I think he was kind of hopeful. I, from what I remember in the beginning of the season, he was like the last guy to get cut and get sent down to the Barracuda. So there was kind of some hope that he was going to crack the lineup or maybe even make the taxi squad. Um but uh, to me, like Ryan Merkley, everyone's everyone's going to be bashing him and stuff or, or calling him a bust. We've seen that in some of our lives already, but I still think it's way too soon to call him a bust. I think um, he's just he's a very gifted, raw talent that needed work defensively. And that's what they've been working on. And then everyone points to his numbers at the AHL saying, well, they're not there. Well, yeah, because he's been focusing on getting his defensive game better, which they said has been getting better. So 
to me, I think he is making strides. He's going to be better. Um, a better overall player and a better defensive player that's going to be maybe not a defensive player, but an offensive defenseman that's going to pick and choose when he can be offensive as opposed to just willy nilly going in into the offensive zone and getting caught up the ice. So I'm not too worried about Merkley, but I did wish we saw him maybe for a game or two in the NHL. Um, I know he had an injury, I think for a little bit. So that maybe that kind of hindered it towards the end, but um, hopefully, hopefully the Sharks still have something there. He's still very, very young. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I'm not on the he's a bus train at all. Um, at the same time, and I know well, you've made the argument. We've, we've talked about this before. You've made the argument, you know, he's he was drafted at 17. He's still very young. 100%, I agree with that. Um, again, my my counter to that, though, is uh, he was drafted that young because he's that good. So you would think that at this point in time, he's had some progression. He's been picked that high. He's been so highly touted. He is elite. Uh, with his his uh, offensive ability, or he has the potential to be elite, I should say. Uh, so you would think that with the amount of time he spent kind of developing, that he'd be ready to go. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm I'm hoping that, and I'm not again. I'm not going to call him a bust. I'm hoping that he kind of figures out whatever it is he needs to figure out uh, to to make himself, you know, available to the NHL roster, or at least a a big threat in the AHL. Somebody who you know starts turning some heads. Because otherwise, uh, I'm not sure how many seasons you have him play at the NHL or at the AHL level before you kind of go, well, this guy is maybe a career AHL or he's a very good one, perhaps. Uh, but if he's not going to crack the NHL roster, that's just another pick that just kind of uh, didn't work out for the Sharks, a uh, first round pick that didn't work out for the Sharks. And I would hate to see that. Um, and, and we'll talk about some of the guys that, that did make the Sharks roster and did make the roster better as the season went on. Uh, but right now, Aaron, you've got this graphic of the original you dug through it through twitter to find this uh didn't take you as long as i thought it was going to to be honest with you but it's it's the original lineup for game one right yeah it's actually it took me a little digging and then you know super producer jason was like we'll just do it this way stupid and i'm like oh okay yeah i found it here it is so here it is the starting lineup uh from the first game so you can see the lines here and i'll read it off just quickly for the uh podcast it was the top line was couture centering with myron lebank Hurdle centering Leonard and Kane, Gregor centering Donato and Nieto, and Shellman centering Sorensen and Marlowe. And then defensive pairings are Vlasic Carlson, Ferraro Burns, Kanijov and Maloch, and then Jones starting with Dubnik backing him up. Um, these lines, some of these guys, I don't think we really saw much shit. We didn't see Shellman very much. Sorensen kind of faded away, which I feel like we knew was going to happen. And Maloch didn't do much. Is that even how you say it? Is it Maloch? I think it's Malak, but I, I'm, I'm not 100%. Now, he was one of the guys, though, I believe that entered the lineup when we had two injuries on defense, and he played alongside one of the other rookies. I cannot remember his name. Uh, or maybe it was Clayson, actually. Uh, and I thought they did a bang-up job uh, playing as the the bottom pairing guys. And I think that's when Kanijov got his shot uh, to play alongside Carlson, and, and then that just kind of stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, I'm looking it up his stats right now. He was actually, he was traded to San Jose for Antoine Bebo back in 2019. I forgot about that. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, this lineup <laughs> was, I guess, hopeful. <laughs> like that this, they were going to be able to do some damage in the season, but just not a lot there. Some of these guys just didn't perform very well for the long run. So um, some of these guys we may never even see anymore in the NHL or are on the Sharks for sure. Um, yeah. Um, so the, the, of the guys that faded away, I think Shelman and Sorensen, I think you're uh, you're kind of done seeing those guys. Um, well, at least Sorensen, I don't know. Shelman's probably uh, working his way back to the AHL, but we'll see. Uh, but if you take a look at that top line again, you had, you had Couture centering who? Meyer and LeBanc. And uh, those two were kind of constantly in the doghouse as the season went on, you know, playing in the third line, uh, playing on the fourth line uh, together at one point, Bob Bugner saying, you know, I, I, they weren't very good. They both stunk, so I put them on the fourth line and let them figure it out down there. <laughs> so, again, one of the things I like about Coach Bob, uh, he's not afraid to kind of put those uh, the, the, the bigger horses in the stable, supposedly, uh, down uh, on the lower lines and say, hey, go figure it out. You know, uh, if you're not here to play, you're not, you're not ready to play, you're not going to play, or you're going to play limited minutes. I do like that. You know, the thing that he's able to police is their ice time, and he does a pretty good job of, of doing that when – uh, they're in the doghouse. So, and unfortunately, two guys in our top six that were supposed to be uh, helping this team out offensively big time 
uh, ended up in the doghouse for the majority of the season. So uh, I think any team has two guys in their top six kind of go AWOL. Uh, it's going to spell disaster for them. But um, anyway, moving on from from that uh, that graphic there, uh, Aaron, there were some predictions that uh, we had going into this season. And uh, maybe not so much that we had, but uh, there was a graphic that you had found and you found uh, interesting. Um, that was in episode number 97. You dug through this one as well. Go ahead. Yeah, this is, this is from our own episode 97, uh, the first episode right before the season started, talking about the lineup and also the prediction of the standings where the Western Conference or Western Division was going to was gonna be and where the, where the chips will lay. So the Sharks were just out of a playoff spot. And uh, we'll just roll this clip and, and you can hear me talk about it. Predictions on standings, like where, the, where every team's going to fall. Yep. There we go. So the number, like if you look at the Sharks, is 54.8. That's the amount of points that are predicted the Sharks will get. So from top to bottom, that's what they're predicting the division to end up. It's interesting that Arizona's at the bottom. Arizona was a decent playoff team, I thought, this last playoffs. Um, obviously, they don't have Taylor Hall anymore, so that's probably a big hit to them. But, um, I mean, if you look, 54.8, that's – if they have – Two more wins than losses than what this prediction thinks. They're ahead of the Ducks. Three more wins. They're right by Minnesota. Let's say three more wins for the Sharks and one more loss for Minnesota. Sharks are in. That's not that big of a difference. <laughs> you know, what's funny is at one point, the Sharks were, what, four points out for a while? Yeah. Even one point out of a playoff spot. So it was definitely doable if the Sharks could have made it, and then they just went on that terrible run in, uh, was it March? End of March and into April. They just took a dive and and tanked it the rest of the way. So um, it was definitely within reach. It wasn't without, you know, out of a reason that they were not, or that they were going to make the playoffs. So not bad. I, I'm still glad that they didn't make it, but <laughs> they'd be getting killed yeah. right now. Yeah, I know they they uh, they stunk it up against the uh, I believe it was the Kings and the Ducks. They had a bunch of games against them, and they just totally blew it. I'm um, looking at the standings right now. Actually, the final standings and the Sharks ended up with 49 points out of the projected 54.8 or whatever it was. Coyotes at the bottom of the division in the predictions. There um, turns out they uh, did did exactly what we didn't want the Sharks to do, which was end up in fifth in the division. Right. Um, just you know. <laughs> High enough to be good, sort of, but not, you know, just they're not going to get a good pick out of this. <laughs> well, it doesn't no. matter. They forfeit yeah, their pick. It doesn't so matter. It wouldn't yeah, have mattered they, for them. Yeah. It was good um, for them to try. Yeah, we could put this graphic up here. I put, I mm-hmm. put, um, so this shows the predicted what we were just looking at from the uh, show uh, 97. Um, so it's in the order of what was predicted and the actual numbers here. So the Knights and Colorado Avalanche actually tied for 82, but Colorado is ahead of them uh, based on the tiebreaker. And then uh, the Minnesota Wild, I think, was kind of a surprise to get that third spot. In fact, they were fighting till the end to get one of the top two spots. So, um, and, and I think I would attribute that to their to their uh, their rookie Kanijov or not Kanijov. That's on the Sharks. Uh, Kaprizov, sorry, yes, K and Z's in there. Uh, Kaprizov, <laughs> the the krill was the krill the thrill. Is that what they call yeah. him? Yeah, Kirill the thrill. Yeah, he's amazing. But uh, yeah, he he propelled them. I think gave them a bigger boost. Uh, the St. Louis Blues looked like for a while that they weren't going to make it, and Arizona was behind them pretty close for a while. But um, we did see Anaheim. I don't know why everyone's so happy on Anaheim. I think they're just terrible and uh, don't have their stuff together yet. They're going to be a good team because they've been so bad the last five years that they've accumulated so many high end prospects, and those guys were kind of playing at the end of the season on Anaheim, so they got a taste of the NHL. I think the Ducks are kind of like where Colorado was maybe four years ago, where they had McKinnon, they had uh, Rantanen was like a rookie. They just didn't quite have all the pieces together, but you could tell they're going to be good. That's where Anaheim is right now. Um, so, yeah, they were at the bottom of the division, which means they're going to be getting yet another high-end draft pick to add to that group. Um, so look for Anaheim to be surging in the division, I think, in the next, man, I would say they're maybe another one or two years out and then they're going to be at the top, kind of like up there with Colorado and Vegas. And hopefully the Sharks will be up there too. 
Well, looking um, at that graphic there, um, the uh, the guys that did the predictions at least got the top half and the bottom half correct. Maybe the the order a little bit misshuffled there, but um, yeah, not bad, not bad, not bad at all. And this was Chris Tier. Was it Chris Tierney? Not Chris Tierney. Chris, I forget the guy's name. It, it showed up on that graphic, but um, he does some great charts, and uh, you should look him up because he does all kinds of charts. If you're into that thing and and stats like total stats geek, it's great. It's fantastic. Chris Tierney, a solid centerman and not too bad with the stats, uh, <laughs> according to Aaron there. So, Aaron, uh, we talked a little bit about, about the uh, the before, um, you know, kind of what was supposed to happen this season. Let's talk about what actually happened here. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, you got this graphic here. The final uh, roster layout for the the final game that the Sharks played. There you go. Um, yeah. Some some new names in there, Aaron. Yeah, I'll read these off again for the podcast. Uh, Hurdle centering, centering Bear, Bonoff, and Kane. Marlowe centering Meyer and LeBanc. Gambrell centering Balsers and Shemlevsky. Gregor centering Bergman and Chakovic. And then Ferraro, Burns, Knijov, Carlson, Pashnuk, and Vlasic. And the goalies, Melnichuk and Jones backing him up. Uh, a lot of players here that were not on that first one. Shemlevsky and Chakovic were in the system. It's good to see them get some, get some ice time. Uh, Pashnik, another one. Bear Bonoff, obviously, he, he came from the trade with uh, Toronto for Antti Suomela, who could not crack the lineup to save his life. So great on the Sharks to get a guy that could possibly be in the top six next season, most likely will be, and they just signed him to a one-year deal, so he will be back next year unless he gets taken. Actually, no, he's not eligible for the draft, so he will definitely be on the Sharks next year. Um, Balser's another guy that was on waivers by Ottawa that the Sharks originally had traded in the Carlson trade to Ottawa. They placed him on waivers. The Sharks knew exactly who he was and what he would bring to the team. So they picked him up right away, and he's been in the lineup ever since. So, um, I don't know, Shemlevsky and Shikovic, I think, was that his first or second game maybe at the NHL level? Yeah, uh, you know, I was just going to say, uh, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair. Um, so, it, it, to be fair, some of these guys are in the lineup because it was the last couple games of the season, and they just wanted to see what they had. Um, right. there there's, I mean, Couture is missing from that lineup because he was injured, right? So he would have been one of the centermen. Marlowe would not have been two C. So, uh, there's, there's some flux and some reasoning as to why some of these names are here. But I guess the point is, again, there's some guys on this roster that, uh, weren't really even named by coach Bob there at the beginning clip, uh, weren't on the opening night roster and just kind of came out of nowhere. Now I know with, um, with Barabanov, he came via trade hundred percent. I think he's a guy that can bring a lot to this lineup. Um, so I'm glad to see him in there and I'm really happy and excited to see what he's going to be able to do uh, next season as well. Uh, but you know, Shmajewski and, uh, Shikovic, you know, who knows, who knows how, if these guys are going to kind of crack the roster next season or not, I think they're going to be in the conversation, uh, just like Bob had at the beginning of this year, you know, talking about Latunov and true, I think it's going to be these two guys that he's talking about. Right. So, um, we'll have to see how that all shakes out and we'll have to see who comes back and who gets traded away, who gets picked and all that other stuff. But, uh, you know, a, a guy that's missing from, you know, the, the goaltending there, Koshinosh, uh, he had a really good showing. But, you know, again, they wanted to give Melnichuk the, uh, another look. And then I, another guy on the defensive side is Shimmick, who normally would be there, but he was dealing with an injury at the time. So, um, you know, th- there's there's a few names that aren't here that would have normally been there. But again, they just want to give some younger guys a bit of a look. So, um, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But again, the main point, there's there's quite a few names here that, uh, it, that just kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, no, I agree. There was some injuries at the end. and But if the Sharks were in a playoff spot, those guys most likely would still be in the lineup. I think they would be playing through those injuries, uh, especially if they're still battling for positioning or, or points to get into the playoffs. So I don't think those injuries were, none of them were, were like kind of season ending. They were just season ending because there was two games left in the season, right? Yeah. Coacher and, uh, and Shimmick. Um, do we know what Shimmick's injury was? I think Shimmick's was a little bit more of a, 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 a actual injury injury. Now, now Logan's probably uh, actually dealing with something as well. But I think you're right. If if this was playoffs, if they were going into playoffs, or if they were you know a point away from making playoffs, Logan would have played. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's no reason to do that to him. Plus, you open up another roster spot to give another guy an opportunity to you know showcase what he can do. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, no, it's good. I mean, it's pretty good. much. I was yeah, going to say, it's, it's kind of all good things being able to get those guys in the roster. Go ahead. Yeah, it's good. It's good to get those guys, even just those two games at the end of the season, give them the confidence, get those butterflies out of their stomach. Now they know what they need to do. 
to prepare. The coaching staff is going to tell them what they need to work on in the summer to be a NHL regular and to, and to crack that lineup and stay in the lineup. So it kind of helps them and boosts them and gives them confidence in themselves because the coaching staff likes them enough to put them in the lineup and, and almost reward them in a way for their good play at the AHL level. So it's good for them. Plus a lot of these guys are going to be sent back down to the AHL for the Barracuda playoff game, which I believe is on Tuesday of this week. So um, they're still going to be able to play and get some hopefully playoff experience because there's that one game playoff in. So hopefully they can get through and keep playing and get some more experience. Uh, that team will be better because a lot of those top end guys that ended up in the NHL roster will be on the AHL roster. So hopefully that can also, uh, I mean, imagine if they, if they pulled through and won the West or whatever the division is at, at the Barracuda level, because they were the last team but all those te- all you have seven teams and all seven are going to be playing in the playoffs. If they could win that playoff and get another, I think a total of eight games is the most they could play. Uh, that'd be fantastic for their development. Not saying they will, but there's always a chance. So that'd be really cool. Yeah, no, hundred percent. That'd be great for them. Um, any chance you get to play a little bit extra hockey, especially in a season like this, where the main problem I think at the beginning was they hadn't played any hockey. They were just getting thrown into you know, actual real games that, you know, are, are worth points. And uh, it's it, you need to have some time to develop. You need to have some time to get your legs back underneath you. Um, so uh, as we talked earlier in the show, the Sharks just didn't have that. So for these younger players to get a little bit of extra time, uh, a little extra ice time uh, will be good for them. So, um, you know, the Sharks did finish pretty much near the bottom of the, uh, of the division there. Uh, here's the thing now. If we're looking at um, where – the expansion draft and whatnot in terms of bottom of the league. And we'll talk more about expansion draft later on. Uh, but if the, if Vancouver gets basically two more points in any way, now Vancouver still has like three more games to play. Um, that will basically put the sharks seventh worst. And then right now, if Vancouver were to lose all of them, the, the sharks would be eighth worst. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit later on, but I just wanted to say, cause we, we had talked about them being near the bottom of the division. Well, they're actually more near towards the bottom of the league. The last little piece that we need to shake out is this uh, business between Vancouver and I believe Calgary. And I think they have a game against Edmonton. So once we, we get that shaked out, we'll figure out more about where the sharks are uh, at, from the league standings. And that'll kind of feed into the discussion about uh, expansion draft and everything else. Uh, but for now, I think we have some more clips. Like I said, it's like a bit of a clip heavy episode. Uh, we want to talk about Bob Bugner and uh, the things that he's happy about for the future of these uh, these players, uh, the teams, uh, the players that we just talked about that are on the team here. Um, I don't know if there's something you wanted to say about this clip before we get to it, or if you just want to go ahead and roll. Sure. This is just uh, the questions um, that Bob is answering is what the good things were from the season. And he kind of mentions a bunch of players by name of NHL caliber players that are now in the lineup that they never even really discussed uh, the year before. So let's roll this clip. Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, sort of we knew this day was coming for a little bit here. Uh, my takeaways are, are, you know, the positive things for me is that I think that we've, uh, you know, we've implemented um, four or five guys, which I feel will be full-time NHLers uh, and already are in, uh, um, you know, and there's more and there could be more. And But I'm just thinking of the names that I think, uh, you know, have made strides and have established themselves. I think uh, um, Gambrell being one of the guys that was a question mark coming in. Uh, Nishoff, obviously, uh, uh, having a rookie season like he did. I think uh, the pickup of Balsers, um, you know, I think that was a great pickup for us, and he's going to really help us next year. Uh, Barabanov, who signed, obviously, at the trade deadline, was a, was a nice trade for us. And, uh, you know, you put him in there, and then you, you, you got the Gregors and you got the Leonards and guys like that. And, uh, you know, I don't want to miss anybody off the list, but those are the guys that come to mind at – you know, last year at this time um, or, or after last season, we weren't talking about any of those names. And uh, um, I don't know if a lot of teams could say that, um, you know, going through the season. Yeah, we're not where we want to be. But, um, you know, minus uh, um, the work that, you know, Doug has, has talked about yesterday in his media, um, you know, improving the team in the offseason. Um, that's a pretty big turnaround. I mean, that's that's six guys that he named off that are going to be, he thinks, are NHL regulars. Now, we talked about this offline. It's like it, not necessarily top six forwards or or top four pairing defensemen, but definitely NHL caliber defensemen and forwards that can be in your lineup or out of your lineup. So 
Um, these guys kind of uh, made a name for themselves for the team, and they will. I think they will all be around next year. They're at least signed through next year. Yeah, I think uh, Gambrell has certainly solidified himself as a. I don't know if it's three C necessarily on on this roster. He was definitely a three C on a roster that. You know, Doug Wilson has said that he wants to go out and get uh, a third line center to kind of help out Hurdle and Kachur for those defensive zone starts for the amount of ice time that they have to play for how heavily they're relied upon to score and generate offense uh, that they, he's looking for a guy that's a three C. So I don't know if that's necessarily not a vote of confidence in Dylan Gambrell because that's where Gambrell was playing. Uh, but, you know, it puts him in a position to be that fourth line center where he can maybe have a more favorable matchup. Uh, he may not be playing alongside two wingers that are more offensively minded, and therefore you're probably not going to see very many points out of Dylan Gambrell. But as long as you understand that that's probably what you're going to get out of him, I think there's no problem with his role on the team. A lot of guys, again, we've talked about this before, they were the best scorers in their league, and they come into the NHL and they have to find a place. And sometimes they turn into the best penalty killer in the league because that's what they need to do. Look at a guy like Matt Nieto, right? He was a guy that was scoring goals left and right, came into the NHL uh, with the Sharks. He was kind of relied on for a little bit of that scoring. But then with Colorado, he turned into this really good penalty killer. So, uh, you know, the guys change their roles up uh, based on on where they are. And I feel like uh, Gambrell might be kind of that guy where he's accepted that this season, got himself a lot stronger on his skates because he's probably going to be going up uh, more against the bruisers, right? The uh, the heavier lines, the blue-collar lines, not the guys that are, um, you know, like the, the McKinnons of the world, right? So um, I, I definitely see Gambrell sticking around. I think he, unless he gets picked by Seattle, and that's definitely a possibility. It's, there's a certain way that that could shake out, and maybe he does get plucked. Who knows? But if he's on the Sharks, I definitely see him kind of in that, that second six uh, center line uh, position. So uh, we'll have to see where that goes. Now, Kanijov, in my mind, He's a, uh, for me, he's a, he's a top four right now. Um, I know it's, it's kind of early to, to say that about a guy who's basically had one solid season in the NHL. But uh, for me, if he's, a, if he's playing alongside Eric Carlson and they look good together, I understand uh, there was a lot that went wrong uh, with the team in general. And a lot of fingers get pointed at Eric Carlson, blah, blah, blah. But for me, uh, if you take a look at how they were able to play together, how they were able to connect passing um, and, and just breaking out together. They looked very comfortable. Now, if you're a guy who can play alongside Eric Carlson, <laughs> yeah, you're a top four in this league. So I'm, I'm more than happy with Kanijov. I think he's, he's done a phenomenal job. Uh, he hustles hard. He does pretty well offensively he, and, and not point generation necessarily, but um, you can see he's comfortable with the puck. And then defensively too, he's been pretty sound. So, I, I mean, I'm happy with the guy all the way around. Yeah, you know, he brought up some other names, uh, Balsers. What a what a job to be able to pick this guy right back up. As you said, you know, they know exactly what they're getting with Balsers. So um, they, they've had him in the system before. He didn't want to leave in the first place. When he became available, they absolutely just snatched him up. I think this is a guy that this season, um, you know, maybe I was hoping for a little bit more out of him once we acquired him. But I think as the seasons kind of go on, uh, you know, he'll be kind of a mainstay on this roster. I think some people were projecting him to be more of like a second line winger. Um, I don't know if I see him that high up. I think third line would be plenty good for Balsers. And, you know, maybe he develops an, into that, but, you know, we'll see. Barabanov, what else can you say about this guy? He is just a phenomenal talent. Um, he is so creative with the puck. He's got great vision on the ice. His skating is is phenomenal. If you see his footwork, um, he does really good stuff there. Um, the, the thing for me with Gregor and Leonard, I'll lump them in together and I'll, I'll pass the ball to you here. Um, or the puck, I guess. Uh, with, with Gregor, yes, he has great speed. Uh, and John Leonard shows uh, amazing promise with his skill level. I, I don't see them as NHL regulars. I see them as guys that are filling in the lineup right now. And every team has these guys, right? Every team has a guy that is maybe playing on their fourth line who would normally be playing in the AHL, but he gets some time in the NHL. Maybe he sticks there. Maybe he sticks there because you know he deserves it, or maybe he sticks there because they don't have any other options. But I think these two guys right now for me, um, I, I don't see them as like NHL regulars. I see them as guys that are kind of still in that that rotating door, but maybe the best option for that rotating door. So go ahead, Aaron, take it away. Uh, I'll just I'll talk about Gambrell. I mean, I think he's on a good team. He's going to be a pretty solid fourth line center. The Sharks can get that third line center to go like a legit third line center to get uh, on the free agency behind Hurdle and and Couture. I think uh, Gambrell is going to fill in that fourth line role. Now think about it this way. Would you rather play every night on the fourth line and help your team win 
or would you rather try and be that third line center and be in and out of the lineup and not be as consistent? That that's kind of like the way players go. It's just same as what you said about Nieto transforming his game to be a penalty killer. That's he had to do that to stay in the lineup. I feel like that's kind of where Gambrell is right now. Is he's a solid centerman. I think he wins. Uh, if I remember correctly, his faceoffs percentage was getting better towards the end of the season. He was focusing on it. If he could be that fourth line center and even kill some penalties, I think he's going to have some very good value and be in the lineup every night. Um, now, yeah, Barrett Bonoff, top six guy. This is unbelievable. This guy was uh, kind of toiling away in Toronto. And um, Balsers, again, I think on a good team, he's going to be a third line winger. Um, what I'd like to see on that third line is if Nieto came back and have him, Gregor, and Balsers. Um, on the same line together. I think that would be a pretty fast line. Uh, maybe take some teams by surprise. Um, and that's assuming, you know, they don't get that third line center I was just talking about. But I think um, I think those guys are kind of interchangeable. And again, most of these guys are, like I said earlier, they're going to be in the bottom six. They're not top six. They're not going to be these all-star players that are hidden gems. Barabanov aside, I don't think Barabanov will be an all-star player, but I think he's a very good um on a, even on a good team, I could see him as a second line winger. Uh, he, f- I feel like he belongs and and will stick for the long term. Um, so yeah, I, I'm happy that these guys made the big strides and and they were in the lineup. And there was one guy that was not mentioned. Uh, he was also not in the lineup in the last game. And we have a quote here from Bugner talking about him. Uh, this is Ryan Donato, and this is a guy that the Sharks went and traded for with Minnesota, I believe a second round, third round pick. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, and uh, he kind of played himself out of the lineup. Now, Bugner's going to talk about why, and he's also, Bugner talks about this with Donato. So he's not the kind of coach that uses the media without talking to him. So don't think he's like being mean about Brian Donato here. So let's roll this clip about uh, Bugner talking about Donato in his game. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not speaking for Doug or, or what the future lies for Ryan. Uh, not really my department, but, uh, you know, um, if he fits the plans and he's back, I think, uh, um, you know, for him, it's, you know, everybody knows he's got a great offensive skill set and, uh, um, you know, he can help you from the top of circles down. I think it's the other part of the game that, you know, um, he struggles with it from time to time. And I think as the season went on, I thought he, you know, guys get worn down and they slow down a bit. And I think it was just a matter of him being able to, uh, you know, stick to the details and, and uh, you know, and help us out that way. But the uh, one thing about Ryan, he's going to, you know, he can help any team because of his offense. Um, he's, he's good in front of the net on the power play. Um, you know, again, he's just uh, is a guy that loves coming to the rink and he's a great teammate and all those things. So, um, you know, that, that's just, and I, and there's nothing I'm saying that I haven't told Ryan, you know, to his face in, in meetings that, you know, we just got to get hit the details of his game just a little better. I think that, uh, um, you, you know, it's, it's, uh, when you're playing against top end players and if you want to be a top six guy, you, you gotta, you gotta be responsible in all areas of the ice. And, uh, that's sort of what we talked about. And I know that I'm looking into this too far. Okay. I know I'm looking into it too far here. But if we look at the choice of words from Bob here, okay, if he fits the plans, if he's back, first of all, he said, I, I'm not Doug Wilson. That's not my department. Then he leads in with, if he fits the plans, if he's back, then he says he can help any team. Um, <laughs> kind yeah. of promoting him. He loves coming to the rink. He's a great teammate. It almost sounds like he's kind of writing his resume for him right now. Am I looking too far into this, Aaron? I'd say he's kind of selling him high here, right? Trying to, <laughs> maybe he's trying to get Seattle to take him in the draft because he would be eligible if the Sharks were to sign him to an extension and he is an RFA. So the Sharks would own the rights to him. He wouldn't, unless they don't sign him and then he becomes a free agent. But, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as an RFA, you don't actually need to have a contract because they can take you and own your rights. A UFA, they you wouldn't have the rights to them, right? But I think with I think with an RFA, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think because it's an RFA, even if he doesn't have a contract, uh, as long as he's got the other requirements, you could still take him um, and and put him on your team, and then you own him. Okay, that makes Maybe. sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, well, if you are if you are watching this on YouTube, please put in the comments down below if I'm correct or not correct. So there you go. Right. See, Aaron, this is where I lean on our our community here to kind of police me, right? Right. So. And 
And it's it's kind of it sucks for Donato because this is kind of his mo when he got when he left Minnesota, and also he was on Boston. He kind of had the same stigma around him was that offensively he's great, but he just doesn't have that 200 foot game, and that plays him out of the lineup because he can't play at the NHL level. He can't play in a top line because he's playing the top lines of other teams, so he's going to get burned and burn the team overall. So um, it it sucks that he hasn't really kind of pick that part up at this point in his career. And I have a feeling that he's, he's no longer going to be in San Jose after next season. Wow. Just like that. Yeah. I think, I think uh, it's easier to cut ties because they have other players that will fit in the lineup. I mean, we saw he wasn't, he wasn't even in the lineup at the end of the season. So um, they have other players there that they would rather have in and younger, younger guys. So it's unfortunate. Yeah, you know, there's another guy on this team that is a pretty solid offensive talent, but needs uh, to work on his 200 foot game. Who also wasn't producing offensively. Can you think of who I'm talking about? Uh, some credit <laughs> union or something, right? Or a bank. <laughs> Kevin LeBankrupt. <laughs> Thank right. you, Lundy, for that one. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, I know Kevin LeBank. Now, uh, I mean, I just I made fun of him a little bit here, but um, and, and what we're about to talk about isn't something to make fun of necessarily, but. Um, I, you know, we, we did have a clip here from Kevin LeBanc talking about, you know, some of the struggles from the season and even the mental health side of it and, that, and just how challenging it was, you know, to kind of go through this very different type of season. So, um, you know, he was you could tell he's not very happy to do this interview. So uh, I apologize <laughs> for the, the low tone. It's probably going to be difficult to hear him. Uh, maybe Super Producer Jason's already boosted the audio. I don't know. But we're going to go ahead and roll this clip and just listen to the words of uh, Kevin LeBanc. You know, when you play that many games in a compact schedule, it, you know, you definitely get a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. And, you know, it, it's uh, hard to physically keep up with that schedule. But, I mean, you uh, you got to do it and you got to push through it and you just got to take care of your body and um, do the ice baths, do the recoveries and make sure that you're, uh, you're staying limber. <laughs> And how about on the mental health side, uh, finally? Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely challenging. You know, uh, I felt like uh, you're just going from the uh, from the rink to your house to your house to the rink, and you know, it was just uh, there was just oh, no no normalcy, which uh, uh, which really sucks. But uh, hopefully, uh, things change next year. I mean, just his body language, exactly. His body language just <laughs> tells you a lot. And uh, his professionalism, I guess, is just not quite there. He needs to kind of, I don't know, if he needs to take a class, have someone kind of give him some tips and how to talk to media. and Give him some tips, did you say? <laughs> nice. Super producer Jason, sorry, uh, that was beautiful, your timing on that one. Tip us on Venmo <laughs> at The Fin Factor. Yes, uh, if you want to go ahead and do that and support the show, please feel free to go ahead and do that. All right, Aaron, go ahead. I, I, to me, he's just, um, I don't know. He, he doesn't seem very interested. And in, maybe he's those players that when your team is not good, you don't play as hard. And when your team is really good, you're playing harder because you're winning. I mean, losing is very difficult. But Bugner has said time and time again, it, you go through some rough times and you see who can get through it and who can't. And there's kind of like two, two sides of the line there. So um, I feel like he's been on the wrong side of the line more often than not this season, him and Timo Meyer which goes to show like where they were in the lineup. Now there was a quote from Bugner, which I did not get a clip of, but he had said in the, in one of those pressers that um, basically looking back uh, there was at one point in the season, the sharks were close to the playoff and he was kind of forced in a way to play those two guys higher in the lineup than he wanted to, because they really needed the points. They needed the skill on those lines and they would have been more punished if you will, than they were all season. So they probably would have gotten even less ice time had the Sharks been in a non-playoff spot for the entire season, like not even close. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they, he was, in a way, Bugner had, was forced to play LeBanc and Meyer more than he wanted to, um, simply because they were better players than the other guys were. But they yeah, didn't. And the sad part it. is, again, if you if you go back to that first graphic that we showed, it's Kat Kajur. And he's flanked by LeBanc and Meyer. These are two guys that were really relied upon this season to put the points up. You know, we were hoping that 
um, they would both kind of take an extra step forward here. Um, you know, Kevin LeBanc, after his $1 million uh, one-year contract that he had signed, you know, signs this one for 4.725 or whatever it is. <laughs> and, you know, they sign him for that because of futures, what we expect him to be. And this season was not a reflection of what they expected him to be. Now, again, he talked about there's a mental health side of this that, you know, it's it's very difficult to to kind of play through the the weird season that it was. And, you know, again, people are going to look at this and go, yeah, but everybody has to play through that. The thing is, again, everyone is different, right? Um, and this is not something that Kevin LeBanc is uh, able to cope with, apparently. Um, and that doesn't make him weak by any means. It just means that he has a hard time dealing with that stuff. And it affects him differently than it affects other people. Um, so the I'm hoping, I am hoping uh, that next year, will be very different for Kevin, um, not just for the Sharks and as a fan, you know, that we want to see them win and he better play well and all that stuff. But for Kevin, too, you know, I think he's a great player. And he just needs to kind of get back on that horse. And if he can get himself to a, a healthy state of mind in a, a, a normal season, some sense of normalcy, uh, you know, fans being in there. Apparently, this is something that really affects the players. Having no fans in the building actually does affect these players. So, um, you know, again, different people will react to this very differently. And for Kevin, it, it, you could tell again with his body language and the fact that he just did not want to be there answering this question. Um, you know, again, I think to next season is going to be a very big season for Kevin. Um, and we'll see if, you know, that leads to, you know, good things for him or if that leads to him kind of maybe being dangled as trade bait. We'll, we'll have to see. Now, Aaron... Um, and briefly, and then we'll move on to the next little clip and, and, and topic here. But um, as far as Timo goes, we've talked a little bit about Kevin here. So as far as Timo goes, give me kind of your take on maybe the problem with Timo. What what went wrong this season and what does he need to do maybe to, to get himself back in the saddle? I, it's hard. I mean, this is going to be all speculation. I have no idea, but it's a it's a big mental game. And if you're not mentally tough for certain things you're not going to perform well so i mean we saw or we will see about vlasic and in, in the end of his 2020 and how terrible that was mentally on him uh we seen dubnik and his wife when he was on minnesota and how mentally draining that was on him so these players are human there's other stuff going on that we don't know about um and it, it's it's hard to say but for me timo meyer i think it's a head thing he's just not it's also a different um different players play differently every night so the difference between a great player and a good player the great player is going to be consistent and playing great or the, at the top of the game almost every night i'm not going to say every night because there's not that many players that are even like that i wouldn't even say mcdavid is like that there's nights where he just does not do well so um but going through dry spells of of many games and just not not just scoring wise but other little details just not doing all those little details which Boudner has been hammering into these guys all season long. It's the little details. When you get those little details down and you get those perfect, even if you're not scoring, the team is going to play better. Uh, Timo Meyer needed to do a better job of driving to the net and using his body, which he did in games. We saw him score or at least get chances doing just that, but he wasn't consistent enough. Um, he's just a big power forward guy and highly skilled but he needs to be more consistent. And I think we even said that last season. I think we said that at the beginning of this season. Same with LeBanc. LeBanc is more about doing the 200-foot game. I think Timo Meyer does a little bit better job than, uh, than LeBanc does at the 200-foot game, but even then he takes some shifts and some nights off. So um, just, again, it all comes down to consistency. These guys are good NHL players. They're not great NHL players, and we all want them to be that next level to be those great NHL players. Um, so hopefully it's something that they can work on this summer. Uh, it's mentally tough. I mean, imagine a, a young single guy playing in the NHL, and there's no fans. There's no interaction with fans. There's no, like you said, you go to the rink and you go home. They're not even allowed to go to the grocery store. They can't get out and do anything. So how do you how do you date? How do you do other things? Like how do you socialize? When, when you're married and have kids, at least you have people at home to talk to, right? <laughs> you're doing Zoom it, buddy. Zoom, right? You're doing the Zoom. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like when you have a family at home, you have other people to talk to. When you have nobody, it's yeah. very lonely and, it, and it's very mentally draining. Um, quick story. When during the lockout, uh, was it Patrick Kane, when they went and played in 
Europe, um, brought his mom along. Do you remember this story? No, go ahead. Uh, Patrick Kane brought his mom along because he kind of had a, I don't want to say a drinking problem, but he had a party problem. He was a young guy and he's celebrating and he's a great player. He brought his mom along so that she would cook for him for one. I mean, two, she's going to Europe for free and gets to hang out with her son, but it kept him honest and it had him have somebody stable at his house and he needed it and he knew he needed it. Um, something like that needs, I think helps people. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you're by yourself and it's very lonely, it's, it's uh, distracting. It could be distracting in a way. So I think they just need a little more stability. <clears throat> yeah, no, hundred percent. Um, and you, you had talked about somebody else. I think it was with Vlasic. You, you just talked about with some of the mental health stuff. Um, one of the things that he was dealing with was, uh, you know, he's a very big dog person. He lost two of his dogs. I think it was the end of 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that, that was something that affected him, you know, greatly. So, um, I don't, I'm not, again, I'm not making excuses for him or anything like that, but I mean, there, again, there's certain things that take your toll on, on these guys. And, um, you know, for anybody who has a dog or has had a dog, um, I think you can kind of understand where, you know, some of that being, you know, he called it the, the worst day of his life or the worst week of his life, something to that. It was just basically the worst. Um, so, uh, you know, it just, again, these guys are human. Um, there's a mental toll here as well. They don't just all of a sudden suck for no reason. They, they know how to play the game. Um, you know, the, whether they're out of, uh, their, their rhythm or out of, uh, you know, their, their training and whatnot, they didn't get a chance to do that. But then again, these, these other factors that kind of weigh into it that, you know, a lot of people just don't know about. And, uh, even Eric Carlson to say, you know, there's, there's certain things people don't know about that were happening behind the scenes, but, um, you know, and they'll never know about this stuff. So, um, we just kind of have to understand as fans that there's more going on than, than we know and, and the media doesn't know everything and necessarily report everything either. So there's that. Also on the topic of Mark Edward Vlasic here, and we want to look a little bit ahead. We've been looking behind and we've been looking at uh, what is has happened most recently with the Sharks and where they are right now. Uh, we want to look just a little bit ahead here. And, um, you know, Mark Edward Vlasic was asked about uh, the, if he was worried about there being a rebuild and and all this other stuff so we actually have a clip of this again and mark edward Vlasic giving his thoughts on that right now no there's no rebuild uh next year we'll be back and uh we'll be competing for the playoffs and for a stanley cup we were on a run there right before i got injured and we were beating the best teams in the league we were playing to our system and if we do that consistently more than we did this year we did that more this year than we did last year, but uh, the, it's a quick turnaround this summer, so that'll be good as well. Um, guys will be able to skate more. We just finished. We're finished tomorrow, so three months from now, we'll be right back at it. So uh, Vlasic kind of telling us right there, look, there's no rebuild. We're coming back, and uh, we're going to compete. Um, now, this could be just, you know, optimism at its finest, uh, given the way that this last season went. Uh, and in fact, you know what? I'm just going to stop right there. Aaron, is he just overly optimistic? I don't think so. I mean, I, I like what he said about, uh, he said they played it. He was talking about the system, saying they played it better this year than they did last year, which I agree. I think, uh, I mean, cultural change with Bugner coming in and systematic changes that he made. I think it takes a while for the for the team to know or to learn it really and to get it down, especially when you have uh, no preseason games to really kind of work things out like that in a game situation versus just, you know, practice, 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 and then you go out into a real game. So I think it took a while. Um, I think in this clip you mentioned it took about 10 games for him to get his game going. So, um, yeah, those first 10 games are kind of – I feel like that's in a normal season. It's the 10 games – the first 10 games is a good test to see – who is working hard and, and remembering the system and then kind of warming up and getting into that game speed uh, just mentally. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't think this team is that far away. I really do think it's a reset, not a rebuild. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on that one. I think uh, depending on how the reset goes, because uh, they are looking to pick up, you know, again, like a three C, they're looking for uh, another goaltender to kind of help um, kind of solidify things on the back end there. I think, Melnichuk and Koshinosh did a, a bang up job, but I don't know if they're necessarily NHL caliber and uh, at least right now. And it sounds like that's one of the uh, areas that Doug Wilson wants to address. Now he may address that by saying, let's just give Koshinosh a whole bunch of training before uh, the season starts. 
And maybe that's the solution. Who knows? But it looks, sounds like he's probably going to go out and try to find somebody. So we'll have to see how that goes. That doesn't bode well for Martin Jones, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you are, are okay with. But um, that's an area that uh, Doug Wilson wanted to, to focus on. Now, uh, Mark Edward Vlasic had said something that I found was interesting. Um, he said specifically that there's a quick turnaround. You know, we're done here you know, after tomorrow, whatever it is, at the point in time of that clip. Um, and now that they're done with the season, again, like you said, quick turnaround. There's going to be playoffs almost immediately after playoffs. They go through the whole drafting process and everything else. And then it's not going to be very long after that, after free agency, they're going to be starting up again. So um, instead of waiting, what, 10 months before they start skating again, it'll be you know a much faster turnaround. And I think that is definitely going to be a big difference. You had mentioned, you know, playing to the system and whatnot. They played to the system this year better than last year. Well, let's think about that. The system that they had last year was still Pete DeBoer's system, right? It was Coach Bob Bugner's half system. Uh, he was just starting to make tweaks to it. Now, this season, he had the opportunity to fully implement the way that he wants his team to play, and then he doesn't get an opportunity to teach it to them uh, until they're actually playing games. So um, I think this season, this coming season, will kind of be a big one for uh, not just the team, but for Coach Bob Bugner himself. Uh, you know, if this is the system he wants them to play and he's going to have the opportunity now to have the training camp and everything else to kind of get them going to understanding the system better, practicing it, drilling it down so that it becomes normal to them, becomes second nature to them, uh, then they get to, to put that into play uh, during the preseason because there will be a preseason. Uh, they, they, I think it's just more things are lining up for them to be successful. So I'm going to have to agree with you. I think Mark Edward Vlasic isn't being overly optimistic here. I don't think they're too far away. And again, depending on how this reset goes, um, they might come out of it better than they ended this last season. Barabanov might take a nice step forward, uh, which he's already done, quite frankly. But then you got to look at guys like Kevin LeBank and Timo Meyer. If this season was something that affected them so much mentally, getting out of that funk and starting off a brand new season the right way in a more normalcy, right? Just more normalcy around them. I think will will bode well for for their play, for their development, and um, ultimately for the team as a whole because they do need these two guys to step up and play top six minutes in a, in the top six roles. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, at least one of them because Barabanov is might be taking that that spot. But you know, if they can do that, if they can be those players. I think this team looks a whole lot better uh, the next season than the last. So that's kind of a, something about, about uh, Margaret Vlasic and his take on it. Aaron, again, you think the same way that I think. I think we're both uh, in agreement here. I think the Sharks are being yeah. a much better team. Do you think they are a much better but fifth place in the division team, or are they fighting for playoffs? I think they're fighting for playoffs. We talked about this, I think, a week ago. Shang Peng had a, a good breakdown of the high danger chances and – Basically, what the the new system of Bob Wugner is limiting the high danger chances against and being one of the top in the league for high danger chances for. Now, you get a guy or you add one or two more guys that are highly skilled guys into that system and it's still producing those high danger chances, they're going to start burying more chances. So you're going to see more goals next season. Um, what, I, what I'm most likely is going to happen is you're going to see more goals for and less goals against. So I think... That's going to change their, uh, if you look at the standings, it shows you the goal differential. It's going to balance it out more um, and they will actually be net positive. So I think that's going to bode well and they're going to get um, probably, you know, five, six, maybe 10 more wins and that that's going to put them in the playoffs. I think it's very doable. Um, it all, you know, it's all going to come down to who is moved off of this roster and who is coming in. Um, but I do think the Sharks are, are maybe two players away getting a goalie, a third line center, um, and maybe a winger, three guys, I'll say three guys. Um, and that will, will be the difference maker of them getting into the playoffs. I'm going to hope for two guys, uh, a goalie and a third line center only because I'm, I'm like, <laughs> this might be optimism. I'm hoping that Kevin LeBanc and Timo Meyer actually take that step forward. And with Barabana being in that top six role already, uh, I feel like that, that whole top six could be very well solidified. Even if you got a guy like LeBanc or Meyer dropping down to the third line, if they find their game, uh, that does give the Sharks a little bit of depth. And if that third line center is uh, as formidable as we're hoping he will be, whoever it may be, then hopefully that's a guy that can kind of kickstart their game uh, should they happen to find themselves on that line. Okay, so we had talked about some uh, player movement you had referenced here. Uh, depending on who comes in, who goes out, 
Well, let's talk a little bit about players that were maybe asked about being on the way out here. So we've got a uh, what we've called a super cut of clips. Uh, I believe this is the last one here. So if you're tired of the clips, uh, this is the last one. Um, so a few players were asked about uh, waiving their no movement clause. Uh, Aaron, do you want to give the names? Do you want to set it up? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, this is kind of there's a lot of these guys are uh, or a lot of these questions with the Seattle draft coming up. If any of these guys would waive their no movement clauses uh, or no trade clauses, whatever they have. Um, so this is Burns, Carlson and Vlasic, the three defensemen that make the most money on the team. They were all asked if they would be uh, willing to move their no trade clause or if they wanted to be a part of the rebuild and if that's what they sign up for on the team. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm here for, you know, the rest of the deal or until they tell me not to. So it's, uh, it's not up to me. You know, I made, uh, I made a decision to commit here and I'm committed here. Uh, I still am. I'm looking forward to uh, the next year already. Uh, there's been uh, some bumps in the road and, and, you know, a lot of things going on that, uh, you know, not many people know about, but um, it's looking good. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited uh, for this group and, and I'm excited for this organization to come back next year in, in, in a much better state than, uh, you know, uh, we've been in the past. I'm here till the end. All right. Thank you very much. I've signed here for 20 years. So I'm going to be here for 20 years. <laughs> 20 I would have years. signed somewhere else if I didn't want to be here. Right. I want to win in San Jose. So I'm Doug has never asked though, as far as waving. No, no. And uh, I, I didn't know I had it till this year when everybody's bringing it up. I didn't know I had it, but I mean, it's, I have it. So, I mean, there's nothing, I have it. So there's nothing I can do about it. It's there. Okay. Um, <laughs> a, okay. Lot, a lot there. There's a lot from each player. You want to go by one by one? Okay. First thing I want to do is I want to clarify on no move versus no trade. Okay. So uh, no trade clause has no effect on the expansion draft because they're not being traded. They're being plucked. Um, that's, that's different. A no move. Um, they, they can't be moved uh, down to the AHL to another team traded away. Th that means there's no movement whatsoever uh, for that player. So uh, if someone has a no move clause, which Mark Edward Vlasic and Eric Carlson both have, they cannot be chosen by Seattle. Um, Brent Burns has a modified no trade clause, which means he can submit a list of three teams. I believe that he'd be okay being traded to. So he says, I, it's not up to me. It kind of is, though, if we're not talking about the expansion draft, it kind of is um, because you can submit a list of three teams that you'd be OK being traded to. So therefore, you do have a little bit of say whether or not um, you would be traded uh, to any of those teams. So um, so there's there's that. Um, well, wait, wait, wait. Let's yeah. clarify that. You have a three team list that you're OK with trades, meaning you cannot be notified and you're just traded to one of those teams. Right. The other way is if they. Doug Wilson could still work on a trade with a different team, but then you'd have the option to veto it. But most likely they're going to like the trade could still happen. It's not like saying the trade won't ever happen. Doug Wilson puts in this trade and says, Hey, Brent Burns, we have a trade for you for Dallas and they're not on your list. Would you be willing? And you go, yeah, I could do that. Yes. Plus he you're could having your GM come to you and saying, we're trying to trade you. <laughs> Yes, he can. He can essentially what you're saying is he can waive the no trade. Right. So exactly. he can. Exactly. Yeah. So um, in that sense, yes. And, and a player that has no move can waive their no move. And that's what these guys were asked to do. I'm not asked to do, but asked about uh, if they were asked to do that. For instance, mm -hmm. like Margaret Vlasic was just asked, were you asked to waive it by Doug Wilson? He said, no, of course, uh, I, I'm not. He said he didn't even know that he had the no move clause until people started talking about it. I'm not believing that for a second, uh, yeah. first of all. Uh, second, the whole, I don't understand this at all. Maybe you can explain this one to me, where he says, "There, I have it, so there's nothing I can do. It, Meaning... It's, it's entire the ball's entirely in your court. What do you mean? There's nothing you can do. The only the only thing to do is wave it, yeah. right? That's the, that's that's everything. You held all the cards. It's nothing Doug Wilson can do. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought it was interesting. I think Brent Burns's answer was a little bit more 
I don't know what the word is like he's guilty of like, uh, yeah, I'm going to be here next season kind of thing. Like to me, it's like, that was like almost a telling sign that Burns might be gone next year. Who knows? I don't know. Just, he was, it was just weird. I mean, maybe it's just the way Brent Burns answers questions, but it just seemed odd to me more so even than Vlasic, his answer. Yeah. His answer. He just seems annoyed. Like, no, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Stop asking me. You know, Burns was also asked, and we didn't have it in this clip, but he was also asked if he was concerned about being moved. And he had basically very bluntly been like, concerned? No, I'm not concerned. And you could take that a couple ways where he's not concerned because he's confident that he'll be here or he's not concerned because, you know, it, no matter where I play, being more being moved or not being moved i'm not I, I don't have a concern maybe he already heard that that's something that they're trying to do again this is all speculation maybe he already heard that something they're trying to do is um see if seattle would be interested in taking him and he's like well then fine if you guys don't want me then i don't want to be here so uh, openly i'm gonna tell people no i'm not concerned because you know whatever uh, so i mean there's a couple ways you can take that um i, I don't know i i still feel like brent burns is a guy that you don't let just walk uh, Brent Burns is a guy that I think other teams would be happy to to make a trade. I understand his uh, his cap hit is pretty big there, but I still feel there are teams out there who would love to have Brent Burns on their team. Absolutely, um, he, yeah. Go ahead. I would say absolutely. And to me, I mean, I've talked about this before. These players they don't have loyalty really to the team. They have loyalty to playing in the NHL. They're to an extent like Joe Thornton wants to win a cup, so he went to Toronto to to get his best friend, but. Uh, to me, Burns isn't even that old, even though he's 36. Um, I still think uh, he's got a couple more years at least in this in this league, the way that he's been able to take care of his body and, and play in the way that he plays. I think he could play easily until 40, maybe even 41. But my point is, like, they want to play in the NHL. They don't, they don't care about what team they play for. It's very rare you see a, a, a player play for their – or even sign as a free agent – Again, Tavares signing for Toronto, but Toronto is like the Yankees. Like everybody wants to play for them. So, um, I, to me, it's like, yeah, Burns is like, yeah, if they if they move me, if Doug Wilson tells me he doesn't want me here, then sure, I'll be gone. Like it's a no brainer. Like whatever, I'll still be playing the NHL, just on a different team. You know, I, I gotta say though, I do particularly like Vlasic's response. Now, I, Vlasic is a guy for me that's kind of. I don't know. I feel like he's rubbed me the wrong way sometimes, even at the practices. Like he's, he seems like he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to, he never, never has like a smile on his face unless he's just like with the guys. But when he's coming on and off the thing, when he's talking with the media, he's just like, you know, he just, um, just has a dry personality. I, think. I, I guess maybe that's all it is, but I have to say, and I, I, I give credit where credit is due. I love his response here. I love that. He said, you know, I, I, I want to win in San Jose. If I wanted to play somewhere else, I would have signed somewhere else. So, um, and I know you just said that players don't really care where they play, but this is a guy that is nearing, not near the end necessarily, but nearing the end of his career. And he wants to win and play in San Jose. I mean, if there's the, there was this idea that maybe he wasn't going to be playing for the team that was going to be competing all the time. Uh, and he had said this too. He loves that. This is what Doug Wilson uh, does. He he loves that Doug Wilson wants to win, you know, every year. He, he's never content with doing a full-blown rebuild. That's why you never have rebuilds in San Jose. And that's why Marco Berflasic wants to win in San Jose because he knows that there's always going to be an opportunity so long as Doug Wilson is trying to just do little refreshes and resets. And it hasn't worked out so far, but um, it, it keeps the team competitive for a very long time, these last two seasons aside. So um, I do like that he had said specifically, I want to win in San Jose. If I wanted to play somewhere else, I would have signed somewhere else. So, um, you know, for, for a guy that maybe I've, he's kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Sometimes that response, uh, I'll pat him on the back. Okay. So, uh, Aaron, the last little bits that we're going to talk about here, and we're not going to go too far into it because we're going to be having a show and I'm telling everybody right now, we're going to have a show, uh, that we do that's specifically for expansion draft talk. So we're not going to delve too deep into expansion stuff right now. Um, so, but plan on on seeing that again. If you're not subscribed to the show, please feel free to hit that sub button, uh, ring that bell, so that you know when we do uh, push these out. We don't give you a whole bunch of garbage. We only talk about things that are worth talking about. So um, 
please feel free to, to subscribe if you've not uh, done so so far. So, uh, but for now, at least, uh, the only thing I think we wanted to really talk about and hit on was that, you know, Doug Wilson, he needs to sign a few more players uh, for, for the eligibility requirements for the draft. So um, there's certain guys that we think might get re-signed. Uh, I think Matt Nieto is definitely one of those guys because whether or not he gets plucked, um, the Sharks could use him or the Sharks could lose him and probably find a replacement out on the on the open market somewhere. So I think he's definitely one. Um, I don't think that they bother re-signing Sorensen, um, but I don't know. Who do you, who do you think maybe they're uh, they're looking at re-signing here? Um, I would say um, I'm seeing, sorry, I just sneezed there. Um, maybe Donato just to dangle him, Donato and Sorensen because they need two more forwards. Um, Nieto, I would think that they would want to sign to keep him and Gambrell as well. So. Um, Man, they need they need two player or two forwards uh, that would be eligible, and they would need to sign them both. So, right now, uh, I'm looking at the list right here. They need to basically we're going to see two signings, and then from there it's going to be uh, who are they going to keep out of those ones, and then who's going to get exposed? Because right now the Sharks can keep or they can protect everybody that is signed through next year. So they're not eligible. They need they need a couple more guys. And as for defensemen, they do have, a, assuming that they're going to protect Carlson, Burns, and Vlasic, that means Shimmick is exposed and that's enough. They don't need anybody else. Um, and then for goalies, they have both Jones and Kornosh, or Kors- Koshinosh, uh, but Koshinosh is not signed yet. He's an RFA, so he would need to be signed. So I would expect two forwards to be signed, and I'm assuming Koshinosh that they're eligible uh, to expose somebody and then um, then we will be ready to do a show and talk about it because right now we could just speculate and speculate and speculate and then watch four players get traded and then we have a whole different lineup and a different team and a different look going to the sp- into the draft so yeah uh, might as well just wait until once all the dust settles and and the expansion draft is about to go so the expansion draft though the date is july 21st right and then yeah. uh, two days later is going to be the uh, NHL entry level draft. Uh, so it's a lot happening at the end of July. So yeah, we're we're gonna do a show, like I said, uh, after the whole expansion draft, or maybe right before. We're, we'll before. figure this out. I think Again, if you're subscribed, you'll know. Yeah, we'll do Go it. Ahead. before. We're gonna do a show before the draft. Probably a recorded show, maybe live. I don't know. We'll figure that out. Um, and then after the drafts. After the expansion draft and before the entry level draft, we'll do another one to talk to break it down. Love it. Yeah, like you said, we can speculate all day, but um, there might be a whole lot of movement. Who knows? Um, this roster could look, uh, I won't say very different because it doesn't look very different when you're just resetting, but uh, if there's a couple guys that might get dangled and I, maybe the top six looks a whole lot different <laughs> than it did at the end of this season. Who knows? Uh, okay, yeah. so like we said, live show for Friday night draft, I think is one of the things we're talking about here. And then uh, just the first round, uh, maybe we'll do a live show or so for the uh, July 23rd um, entry level draft. I think that'd be fun. Get on there with some guys, get some comments going in the uh, the comment section there as we're, we're kind of reacting live to at least up until the point where the Sharks make their draft pick. And then after that, I don't think anyone's going to care. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, a live show for the entry level draft would be great because the Sharks will be in the at the least top ten, right? Yeah, the lowest. Yeah, and actually, let me end. explain that one one more time because um, I, I kind of touched on it earlier, and it was kind of something that I we maybe put a little bit out of order. That's okay. Yeah. Um, but it basically, again, if Vancouver gets two more points in any fashion, I believe it's the the Sharks will end up with the seventh best odds in the lottery which essentially means they can either win the first win second um in terms of the pick right or nobody moves from behind them ahead of them and they stay seventh or one or two teams from behind them move in front of them in which case they would get either eighth or ninth so any way you slice this and again sorry if vancouver does not get two more points and they end up in seventh, we'd be eighth. So that shuffles a little bit, eight, nine, 10. So either way you put it, right? The Sharks are going to get a top 10 pick this draft. It's just a matter of whether or not it's going to be a number one, number two, potentially a number seven through 10, right? So those are the ones that uh, the Sharks are, are possibly looking at. And of course, 
depending on what which draft pick they get, there's obviously some very different players that are going to be available. So Aaron and I will be talking about that in the next episode. But until then, I think we're done with this one. Aaron, anything you want to wrap up here you want to say? Well, I was told there would be no math. <laughs> uh, there was no math. I, I did it all for you. There you go. <laughs> um, no, just excited. Uh, get a little break here. And uh, are you gonna are you gonna be watching the playoffs at all? Any of the teams that you're rooting for? I, I if I watch anything, it'll be Jumbo, and that's probably it. Yeah, I like Jumbo. Yeah, I, I, and I like Toronto too. I mean, I like the players. I don't really want to see Toronto win, but. <laughs> I like the players, so. Yeah, man. Get on with it! Yes, Jumbo, get on with it and win a cup already. All right, that'll do it for this show. Hey, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. And uh, if you happen to listen to me earlier in the show and threw a Venmo tip our way, we'll be sure to put your comment uh, live during the next live show. Uh, Well, I guess it wouldn't be live during the live show, but we'll put your comment on the live show is what I meant to say. So uh, there you go. And hopefully you join us live and you can see it there. Regardless, again, thank you guys so much for tuning in. This has been a horrible, horrible season, and <laughs> so happy that it's over. And we can't wait for the next one to start up so we can complain about that one, too. So until then, for Super Producer Jason, I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. We will see you guys at the Seattle Draft. Seattle Draft. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.